And so we're coming up on the tail end of primitive mythology here, uh, part four, the archaeology of myth now. And in this chapter, uh, Campbell will go back uh, all the way as far down into the well of the past, as, as Thomas Mann called it, uh, as he can go, looking for evidence of uh, any kind of spiritual or religious activity or ideas or beliefs amongst these early hominids uh, as he goes through and looks at the hominization process which um, his chart here is, of course, totally out of date uh, and needs a totally new timeline, like uh, what we did with the chapter on the Neolithic. So here we have chapter 9, Mythological Thresholds of the Paleolithic, and he starts here with the stage of Plesianthropus, uh, 600,000 B.C. Um, nobody even uses that term anymore for Plesianthropus, and the, the dates are uh, ridiculously early, so we have to go back and look at the hominization process, or what I call hominogenesis. Um, if that word doesn't exist, it does now. <laughs> um, so hominogenesis begins, uh, it really the hominogenetic zone is Lake Turkana. They just keep finding more and more stuff in and around uh, Lake Turvana, uh, Turkana, uh, Olduvai Gorge. Um, we have this fellow, seven million years ago, Sahel Anthropus chadensis, uh, who may be the earliest uh, of our ancestors, it was basically an upright chimpanzee, may have been bipedal, uh, but still has very long arms. Um, so I doubt whether he was strictly bipedal. He may be like a transitional figure. And I don't want to go through all the, all the individuals leading up to the process uh, where things get interesting, because I don't think they get interesting until the appearance of Homo habilis. Uh, 2.6 million years ago to 1.6 million years for Homo habilis. And uh, Homo habilis is the first to begin making stone tools, as far as we know. He's got these old Dowan tool industries, except that now uh, some slightly earlier stone tools have been found in Olduvai Gorge uh, called uh, Lomequian tools, 3.3 million years ago, so a little earlier than Homo habilis. So we're not sure who made these Lomequian uh, stone tools. They may have been made by Australopithecines, although I doubt it. Uh, but Homo habilis, with Homo habilis, he never... This fellow never migrates out of Africa. We start to see the building. Uh, he's moving rocks and stones around to build walls. Uh, evidence of crude uh, shaping of walls uh, is being made, and stones, semicircles, have been found uh, in connection with Homo habilis. So this individual is the first time in it to start thinking geometrically and to start uh, bringing matter in and subordinating it to conform to ideas. That are, being, that are emerging now out of his brain and capable of being exteriorized in the form of what McLuhan called technology as extensions of human anatomy out into the world realm. So that's what this guy is doing. Uh, we also find that at some of the sites at Old Divide, they were collecting uh, pieces of green lava. They apparently liked the, the green lava. And Campbell in this chapter uh, comments about uh, the researches on chimpanzees done by Wolfgang Kurler uh, who talked about how some of the chimps would occasionally develop inexplicable attachments to objects like favorite stones. Uh, one of his chimps had an attachment to a stone that was beautifully polished by the sea, and you could, under no circumstances, according to Curler, get that stone out of his palm. Um, so already there's that aspect. Plus, chimpanzees already have the idea of swaying in motion and dancing kind of in a circle, whirling around a center. Uh, so we've already got the basic elements there, a dance and the fascination with uh, interesting anomalous objects already amongst chimps. So with Homo habilis, who also at some of the sites at Olduvai had lumps of red ochre there. Now if Homo habilis had red ochre, uh, red ochre is universally associated with burial as we have seen uh, in the previous episode. Um, the earliest burial that we know of dates from 100,000 BC in Palestine at Katse. Uh, where 15 or 20 individuals were found, modern Homo sapiens, uh, and one grave was known as Q9, was of a woman found with an infant at her feet covered with red ochre. So right there with the first burial, we've got red ochre used in Palestine, and 30,000 years ago at Lake Mungo in Australia, we also find a burial there covered with red ochre. So there's a vast geograph geographical distribution from Palestine to Australia with the use of uh, red ochre. Um, so I think that if Homo habilis had red ochre found at his sites, he most likely was burying his dead. We just haven't found the bodies. Uh, but he's already thinking geometrically, this fellow. And Homo rudolfensis, 
There's a debate about whether habilis and rudifensis are two different species or whether they are simply two different variants of the same Homo habilid family. With Homo erectus, Homo erectus and Homo ergaster also may be not two species but two different variants of the same erectine family. Homo ergaster dates from 1.75 million years ago in Africa, but Homo erectus is the first of these hominids to migrate out of Africa with Homo georgicus now, who has now been found in Georgia 1.8 million years ago. So he's already migrating out of Africa, generally doesn't get out of Africa until a million years ago. And we have the earliest use of domesticated fire now with Homo erectus at sites in Africa like Kubifora and various other sites where fire is being used. It used to be thought that Shoko Chen in China about 700,000 years ago was the earliest domestication of fire, but now we've got it here definitely in Africa with Homo erectus, who also now is creating what are called Acheulean hand axes, which are axes that are too big to be of any practical use, and they're too beautiful. They're superfluously beautiful. So there is already an evidence here of a grade of consciousness that is capable of appreciating objects as works of art, and it may very well be that these Acheulean hand axes are already symbolic of something, possibly thunderbolts. Axes throughout history and mythology have been associated with thunderbolts, Thor's hammer, Mjolnir, the thunderbolt hurled by Zeus, and possibly Neptune's trident may be a modified thunderbolt since he was originally a land god who was re-territorialized to become a sea god. Poseidon, Poseidon, the name means Lord of the Earth, so he wasn't originally a sea god, so his trident is probably a modified thunderbolt as well. And maybe these Acheulean hand axes, they appear to be ritual objects, and they're very beautiful, and they may be the first works of art. We don't know. Homo erectus is making them, and they spread. They have a distribution across as far as India. And then, moreover, at a site in France called Terra Amada, 300,000 years ago, we have the first appearance of independent houses. They're huts that are triangular-shaped, made out of branches that have been woven together to create these huts on the beaches of Nice in France, where Homo erectus lived. And there were animal skins on the floor. The floors were lightly paved. They had fire. It was warm on the inside. So already we have the first creation of the first huts at Terra Amada, 300,000. And then, of course, that date, 300,000. Contemporary with that, we have Homo heidelbergensis, which is the proto-Neanderthal, already living in Europe, having originated at the end of the glaciation period known as the Guns, which comes to an end about 600,000 years ago. And with that warming coming out of that glacial period, Homo heidelbergensis appears about 600,000 years ago in Ethiopia, migrates into Europe, where at Ataparca in Spain, as we have seen 300,000 years ago, we find the earliest possible evidence for burial. In that cave, they're throwing their dead through this hole in the ground where they're just lying down in this large structure that very likely was conceived of as a kind of womb-tomb type thing. So that's contemporary. We have Homo heidelbergensis, the proto-Neanderthals, living 300,000, Ataparca, Spain, and then Homo erectus, which is late for Homo erectus, 300,000 at Terra Amada, living apparently peacefully side by side there with each other on the shores of France, the beaches of France there. So yes, and with Homo heidelbergensis also, we have, Lewis Binford has this ridiculous idea that he's one of these guys who tries to deontologize Neanderthals and rob them of any kind of human status. And one of the things he said to do this was that they weren't hunters. They weren't really hunters. They were probably just scavengers coming along. Not the case. We found wooden spears six to nine feet long amongst Homo heidelbergensis dating from 400,000 years ago with very sharp tips. They were big, long spears. These were burly men. They were definitely hunters. They were very dangerous hunters. They had also already developed by this point the technique of chasing animals over cliffs. As we have seen with the myth of the buffalo's wife, some such myth as that may already have existed amongst Homo heidelbergensis. So this was a very dangerous hunter. 
So then we have um, modern Homo sapiens then, appearing at the earliest 160,000, uh, also in Africa, at Herto, Ethiopia, where we find uh, modern Homo sapiens in connection with the apparent reverence of skulls. Two, polished, two skulls were found uh, with the back part of it, the foramen magnum, removed to facilitate possibly access to the brains, and uh, it was polished, um, and the skulls were separated out. Now, Neanderthals have uh, more or less a skull cult. They, we find at lots of Neanderthal sites not only evidence of ritual cannibalism, such as at uh, 400,000 years ago with, uh, at Arago, where we find bones with incision marks on them, where clearly the meat has been removed, and in connection with the food supply, there didn't seem to be a food shortage, so it wasn't likely uh, the result of shortage of food. Uh, Neanderthals, a lot of them, I think, were cannibalistic. Uh, we find the head also revered consistently in Neanderthal burials, where the head will be removed, separated from the rest of the body, the jaw removed, as we saw with Mashi 60,000 years ago in Palestine, where the top of his cranium was missing. Uh, and Neanderthals had a habit of separating out the jaw, taking the rest of the skull, and putting it somewhere. In some cases, you'll find uh, the head turned upside down with a circle of ibex horns uh, arranged around it. So they already did have some sort of idea of ritual cannibalism, possibly in connection with a headhunting cult, uh, where the two turn up uh, in the Indonesian culture zone that, that continues amongst the Borneo and the Dayaks, and, uh, or amongst the Dayaks of Borneo and, and so forth. Um, so then they migrate, with, with the migration then of modern Homo sapiens uh, into Europe, 40, about 45,000 years ago, we have the beginnings of the Aurignacian, which ends 27,000 years ago. Now note that uh, the Aurignacian is exactly the period of the cohabitation of Europe with the Cro-Magnons uh, side by side with Neanderthals, and it was apparently not a happy one because the Neanderthals lost, and they're wiped out by, as we saw them in Spain, 27,000 BC, the last vestiges of them with the human, uh, or with the Neanderthal, uh, modern Homo sapiens hybrid at Legarvello, the four-year-old boy there uh, that has elements of both. And so the Ordnitian is, of course, the period of the creative explosion. We get Chauvet, 33,000. Uh, the first parietal art starts coming in with these paintings that are monochrome at first. It takes a while for them to get to become polychrome. Uh, and then the Salutrian period is 23,000 to 18,000, which is a short-lived period. It's the climax of the cult of the goddess in Western Europe and the last appearances of her uh, at sites like Lazelle, uh, whereupon with the Magdalenian, 18,000 to 10,000 BC, she's gone. And we have the finest cave art flourishing during the Magdalenian. During the Salutrian, the bow and arrow had already been invented. It was thought to be later. Uh, it actually turns out to be earlier than we thought. It's Salutrian. Whereupon also with the Salutrian period, we have the first atlatls are used. The, the word atlatl is an Aztec word. Uh, for a spear thrower, that's already going on there, and the Salutrians have developed the art of chasing animals over cliffs uh, to an art form. It may, in fact, have had something to do with the, the extinction of a number of these species at about this time. Um, so with the Magdalenian, 18,000 to 10,000, we get the final phases of the art at Lascaux. Uh, Lascaux and Altamira, the great chapels of the climax of this art style. And then with the melting of the glaciers, everything melts. Um, and apparently a dark age results, but there is a sort of epilogue here with what Campbell was calling here the Capsian microlithic style, that, which dates from around 12,000 to 10,000 BC, where a new people has come in out of North Africa, um, clearly, and that's now it's called the Spanish Levantine style, I think. And they have come out of North Africa with an art of etching and engraving animals onto stones and rocks, but also in a number of these sites up here in Eastern Spain, where we find uh, a sort of shrinkage of the cult of the animal. Uh, we find a lot, the animals are much smaller and the human figure has been gigantified and raised and enlarged. And we see lots of human figures in contention fighting each other with bows and arrows, an art form that's not in caves, but out in cliffs and rock ledges, and which is totally at odds with the earlier Paleolithic art that was down in the core womb, tomb caves that were very difficult to, you had to crawl through. If you were claustrophobic, you were in trouble because you had to crawl through very narrow, crevices to get back to see these cathedrals of art. Not so with the Spanish Levantine style. It's, it's an art of the daylight. It's taking place. Uh, there's, as Gebser would put it, I think here, there's the beginnings of an awakening of human consciousness to the light of day. And these peoples have come over from North Africa, uh, which, and this includes the whole art style that includes uh, the Fazan with the Tassili art and the gigantic human figures. 
And these people may have been Capoid. They may be the ancestors of the Bushmen. The Bushmen still claim that they did the art at uh, Tassili, so th that may have been the case. And this is exactly a contemporary now with Gobekli Tepe, which is a new site that has been found in eastern Turkey that dates from this period, 10,000 BC, which is absolutely magnificent. The first use of monumental stone to create huge stone circles with T-shaped capitals that have great and beautiful totemistic animal images carved onto them so that the cult of representing animals uh, on the walls of the caves has migrated to a cult of making the animal forms portable and putting them onto pillars so that they're visible out in the daylight. Up on the, they're up on the top of a hill. Um, but this was a Klaus Schmidt thing. These, these were still hunters with lots of shamanism going on here, which may be, but agriculture in that region is already up and running at Abu Huraira, which as we have seen, uh, the earliest evidence for the domestication of rye and einkorn is found there uh, at Abu Huraira, which is a village on, uh, in Syria on the upper Euphrates located near gazelle migration routes. Uh, and these are the Natufians. And the Natufians seem to be the inheritors of the Paleolithic culture. They don't have goddesses in their culture. They carve little animal figurines, but there are no goddesses. So they seem to be culturally uh, related to what was going on in Western Europe. Uh, there are some burials that exhibit uh, similarities to some Gravettian burials from Eastern Europe. So the Natufians seem to have carried this tradition on into Palestine and invented agriculture there, where with Gobekli Tepe and Abu Huraira and also Miraibet, which is another village, where the goddess does appear and begins to make a reappearance, uh, we find a whole new explosion and entry into the Neolithic with uh, about 10,000 BC to down to about 8700 BC, the pre-pottery Neolithic A. So we'll move into the Neolithic next.